The origin of consciousness and life. Now, uh, there have been a great progress in the field of artificial intelligence. But at the end of the day, intelligence goes with consciousness and life. Intelligence, consciousness, life. These are three different phases of a single cube. And I would say that the purpose of this cube is to survive well in this complex world. Now, uh, Charles Darwin published on the origin of species his magnum opus in 1859. And he put forward this idea that two fundamental principles, the fact that there is variation in the phenotype and also the fact that there is a process of natural selection would lead to the diversity of life that we see on the Earth. Now, any reasonable person can almost immediately see that the combination of these two principles would indeed lead to a diversity in life. Of course, it took more than 100 years and the process is still going on to work out the detailed mechanisms. Now, uh, in the field of consciousness studies, we are not so fortunate. Nobody has written on the origin of consciousness yet. Maybe one of you guys might come up with a brilliant idea one of these days, 2000 something, right? We still don't know what are the first principles that gives rise to consciousness from materials like the human brain. Of course, even if we came up with fundamental principles that gives rise to consciousness, it would take another 100 years or more to work out the details. But what we do need is to come up with some brilliant idea that explains the uh, existence of consciousness. Now, uh, people have been talking about the neural correlates of consciousness, or in general, physical correlates of consciousness. We have not worked out what the membership functions are for consciousness. For example, some people claim that even thermostats have consciousness. Some people say that only higher cognitive systems like the human brain, which is equipped with linguistic abilities, have consciousness in the true sense. In any case, we believe that there is a subset of physical processes, and that subset would give rise to consciousness full of qualia, intentionality, and self-awareness. Uh, on the other hand, we can talk about the physical correlates of life, right? This is what the researchers in artificial, artificial life is doing. Compared to consciousness, interestingly, there seems to be the perception that there's indeed a continuum of uh, changes from non-life to life. Whereas there's such a sharp border between non-consciousness and consciousness, as we all know from our daily experience. When we are awake, we have this phenomenal experience with a lot of qualia, but when we are asleep, we are not there. So there's this zero-one distinction between consciousness and non-consciousness, but there seems to be less uh, distinct uh, distinction between non-life and life. So there are some people who are arguing about whether the viruses are considered to be uh, life or non-life. Anyway, um, the fact is, through the history of evolution, biological systems have been under this very interesting constraint. And the constraint is the fact that there is much more sensory data than can be handled by the cognitive systems. If you talk about a single cell or the human brain, there has this overflow of information in the environment. We would very much like to make use of all of them, but we simply cannot do it. It's an ill-posed problem. So if you take this view, you see a coherent structure of uh, homework, so to speak, for life and consciousness in common. It was necessary for life forms to handle the abundance of sensory data in some way and its cognitive capacity. And it was necessary for consciousness to somehow represent a gist of the information that is available in the environment. And I would say that because of that need, we evolved to have sensory qualia, intentional qualia, and so on. 
Now, uh, I'm coming to the most probably controversial claim of my talk. Uh, I believe that consciousness should ultimately be explained in terms of the immediate physical properties of here and now. For example, I am having a phenomenal experience right now standing on this stage. The qualities of my phenomenal experience should be ultimately explained in terms of the nature of physical processes, processes that is going on in my brain at this moment. This immediacy principle is in marked contrast to the conventional statistical approaches. You can talk about Bayesian inference or you know, statistical learning rules and so on. These are great. I'm not saying they are rubbish. I'm just saying that you cannot really apply statistical approaches as a first principle to explain natures of consciousness because it is by their own nature, statistical models go beyond space and time. That is their strength. They accumulate an ensemble of data, not just one cognitive uh, moment, but many, many cognitive moments of many, many individuals. And they make statistical reasonings, which works great when you build artificial intelligence systems. But I regret to say, has nothing to do with the properties of consciousness at this spacious moment. So I'm proposing to uh, start from what I call Max principle. Uh, this is the idea that, well, each individual entities in the universe uh, acquire their individual properties through the interactions each other within the network. And there would be a certain compression process, so to speak, that compresses all the rich networking uh, properties onto, back onto individual entities. Now, uh, of course, nobody has worked out what the detailed mathematical structure of this uh, process would be, but it is totally different from the kind of mathematical formalism that is typically used in statistical models. This model is based explicitly on interactions, on causality, rather than the properties of ensembles taking over space and time, taking over individual experiences. Uh, I have been proposing for some years that uh, to materialize uh, what is implied in Marx's principle, we really need to come up with two different uh, concepts of simultaneity. One is T simultaneity, which corresponds to the intentional processes in the brain, top down, coming down from the prefrontal cortices, and sensory or tau simultaneity, which uh, represents the process uh, from of the bottom up uh, sensory processes. So for example, in the human brain, there would be the primary visual area, V1, and all the way to V2, V4, for the processing of color and form, or MT or MSD for the processing of uh, place and motion signals, all the detailed interaction between these neurons should be as uh, described in terms of uh, tau, uh, which can be, uh, which is similar to the proper time uh, concept in relativity theory. And uh, the fundamental idea is that when information is processed from one unit to one unit, in general, there would not be any passage of proper time, tau. So this is, uh, so I believe that, uh, I, I am postulating that uh, it is through the interaction between these two different temporal structures that gives rise to our consciousness. So again, tau simultaneity is concerned with the formation of qualia, and it is also concerned with a spacious moment in psychological time. On the other hand, T simultaneity, it is concerned with the formation of intentionality structure and also the spatial structure in phenomenal experience. So at the end of the day, we have consciousness in order to survive. What is the selective advantage that consciousness bestows on biological systems? I think that it is the integrated parallelism in a sensory processing process. For example, if you take a visual field, 
you see many, many things in parallel. Uh, there are uh, distribution of uh, sensory qualia in the visual field, but it is integrated within the single agent of me. So this is an integrated parallelism. So the question is, how can we work out the details of this integrated parallelism? Well, uh, I believe that the tau simultaneity and t simultaneity play important roles in it. And in addition to that, we really need to understand metacognition. Now, this is the hard part. Uh, I honestly don't know how we can formally describe metacognition. Metacognition is the way a system bootstraps itself from the interactions within its system so that the individual entity of the percepts would be established within its conscious state. For example, if we see something red, within your consciousness, it is established that it is red indeed. Metacognitive process has to do with the establishment of this unique individuality of your percepts. So in a sense, metacognition equals consciousness. So it is that hard. I'm not claiming here that I have a model of, of consciousness. Not, in, not the least, the model of consciousness. I'm not claiming that. I'm in the dark as much as you are. But I'm just saying that in order to really elucidate a model of consciousness, we really need to understand metacognition. So um, I have described that overflow, sensory overflow, is a, a very important cons a constraint on the evolution of biological systems and conscious systems. So there would be the metacognition to kind of try to solve the impulse problem of representing a gist of uh, overflow of information within the cognitive system. And within that uh, process, there would be this simultaneity issue, which I described tau as tau simultaneity and t simultaneity, which give, would give rise to the integrated, integrated parallelism that is the hallmark of our conscious experience. Now, this is a tricky issue. How many of you believe that there is free will? You know, it is, oh, okay. <laughs> it is such a fundamental idea. You know, we would be, you know, we would lose our mental balance if we don't feel that we have free will. But if you are a good physicist, there's no room for phys, uh, free will. If you well, kind of refer to quantum indeterminacy, that only gives rise to random processes, right? So there's no way we can you know, work out uh, from scientific point of view how we can actually have free will. Well, most of people, most of the scientific community, I think, uh, think that free will is an illusion. However, at the end of the day, the adaptive function of consciousness, if there's any, should be free will, or the fact that we can choose and modify our actions in a flexible manner. So there should be some, well, illusory free will uh, within the consciousness experience. I, I, I don't understand free will, but I, well, my portrait here is that in order to understand causality, you need to have a good uh, concept of time, right? And I feel that there is some, some non-trivial uh, principle that is yet to be discovered by us, right? And if we discover that non-trivial principle describing time, maybe there would be a backdoor to free will. So that free will would be connected to causality through this backdoor. That is my, uh, you know, hypothesis. So I have been talking about all these very speculative uh, things. Uh, believe it or not, it's not my day job. <laughs> I do other things. Uh, I, 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 as John Lennon said, uh, life is what goes on while you make other plans. But from time to time, I come back to these fundamental questions. And I, well, my take home message is that there is someone who believes that statistical approaches, no matter how powerful they are, cannot explain consciousness ultimately, and we really do need some 
fundamental alternative principles. And I think there are a lot, of, lot to you know, share uh, with uh, the Artificial Intelligence Research Committee and Consciousness Studies. So that's my talk. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.